All right, so for this video clip, we are going to be considering the respiratory system, which only has two slides for you to look at. There's the trachea and then the lung tissue. This first one here is the trachea, and like the other mucous membranes in the digestive system that we've looked at, there's going to be the mucosal layer, there's going to be then a submucosa, and in this case, we don't have a continuous muscularis layer, but we have this cartilaginous as well as muscular layer. And then finally, on the outside, we're going to have adventitia. This is what's going to be the connected tissue that holds the trachea into the surrounding uh, body tissue. So we still see up here at the lumen uh, mucosal layer. And that mucosa is going to have an epithelial layer as well as then a small lamina propria. Below that, we're going to have the submucosa. And in the case of the trachea, the submucosa is going to have some glands. So we have these tracheal glands that are a mixture of both mucus as serous glands. These are going to be found in the submucosa. The third region is going to be that cartilage slash muscle layer. And in this area, it's very obvious that we're looking at the cartilaginous rings. This is nice highland cartilage. And then finally, as I mentioned on the outside, we have the adventitia. If we look closely at the mucosa, we can see the very classic pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue that, that's common throughout the upper respiratory tract. We also can see the presence of goblet cells. Right? So the goblet cells here are producing the mucus. We have the cilia that lines this upper respiratory tract, in this case the trachea, that's going to help move that mucus. Right? The idea of the mucus, again, is to help trap dust and other foreign particles. And the cilia are able to move that up the trachea and into our throat. And so we have, again, that very classic pseudostratified look. All of these share a basement membrane, but some of these have very short ones, and we can see that these nuclei appear to be stratified, but in fact are all one continuous simple layer. Down below, the pseudostratified layer is going to be that submucosa. And again, from the previous slide, if we go back to this, we can see that often there are some really prominent glands within the submucosa, these tracheal glands. This is now the posterior surface of the trachea. And from this magnification, we can still see the ET layer of the mucosa. This is that pseudostratified. We can also see some of them submucosa. It's not as obvious as the previous slide was. But why I'm showing this here is because, remember, in the trachea, this cartilaginous rings, these hyaline cartilage rings, are C-shaped. And that C is going to exist on the anterior surface, but it's not going to continue all the way around the posterior surface. And in fact, here, this is the nice example of the trachealis muscle. So between the two points, you can imagine this is the back end of the C. Here's the one point of the cartilage, and then here's the other. The region between these two points is going to be filled with this trachealis muscle. And that's that smooth muscle layer that's going to help change the diameter of the lumen, maybe under periods of coughing or something. So the trachealis muscle, the very classic smooth muscle, those spindle-shaped cells with a nice central nucleus. And that's going to be in the same layer as the cartilage. It's just going to be only on the posterior side. And then again, finally, we have this adventitia layer, which is not on your list, but just a reminder that the trachea is going to be embedded in the surrounding tissue. And so it's going to be through this connective tissue layer out here. So that's the trachea. Um, again, the emphasis there is on the pseudostratified ciliated columnar ET with goblet cells, as well as then the C-shaped cartilage rings that we see on the anterior and lateral surface and then the trachealis, the smooth muscle on the posterior surface. The other slide we have for you are the, is the lung. And there are a few structures in here. The first one on our list is the, are the bronchi. Now remember that bronchi are the larger conducting tubes. So as the trachea is branching, it gives rise then to the various branches of the bronchi. The thing that you will notice, and there's not one on this slide here, is that the bronchi are still going to have the cartilage. And so if you are looking at lung tissue and you see a tube that has cartilage, then you are looking at the bronchus. And that, that's, that's really all it is. These tend to be pretty large. We have certain slides that are labeled uh, lung tissue with bronchi, I believe. The other tubes that we can see are going to be smaller, and they're the ones that do not have the cartilage. And the one that we can see in this field of view here first would be the bronchioles. And so as the bronchi get smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually they give rise to the bronchioles. And the thing to notice here is this tube, it's cut in longitudinal section. Here would be one cut more of an across section, and here's another one cut more in a cross section. But these tubes do not have the cartilage support plates or rings around them. And so a tube that has a obvious cell lining 
In this case, it looks almost um, cuboidal in certain areas, and it may have a very, very narrow, smooth muscle layer. These are going to be the bronchioles. The bronchioles are going to be the smallest of those conducting tubes before they then become the alveolar ducts. And so you can see that this is one continuous tube. It's coming in here, and it's branching either up into this alveolar duct or into this alveolar duct. And the difference between the alveolar ducts and the bronchioles is that you can see the alveolar ducts, they're lined with alveoli. So there's not a continuous barrier or wall in the alveolar ducts. These are all going to have alveoli lining their walls, whereas the bronchioles have a nice continuous columnar um, lining. The alveolar ducts then are going to lead into these dead ends called alveolar sacs. So any area that's going to have a common space surrounded by individual alveoli, these are those individual clusters that, where the gas exchange take place, this is going to be referred to as an alveolar sac. So in the analogy of, of a bundle of grapes, so the bundle of grapes is comparable to the alveolar sac, whereas the individual grapes would represent the alveoli. And so here we can potentially call this an alveolar sac with then a few individual alveoli, sorry about that, alveoli lining the pocket. So again, when we look at the lung tissue, if you see tubes that have cartilage, it's going to be a bronchus. If you see tubes that have an obvious barrier, maybe columnar, maybe cuboidal, maybe a little bit of smooth muscle, that's going to be a bronchial. If you see clear little passageways that are lined with individual alveoli, then that's going to represent the alveolar duct. And the alveoli themselves are the individual little sacs that then are clustered around a common opening referred to as the alveolar sac. So you're going to have to look around for these, finding good examples of something that you see here with the nice bronchial leading to an alveolar duct, leading to an alveolar sac. This is not easy. Um, a lot of the slides don't show this very well. And so be patient and look around for this as an example. The other part of the lung slide that you're going to have to be able to work, look at would be at a higher magnification. So this is either under 400 or 630 times magnification. And at this magnification, we can see the individual cells that make up the, the alveoli, the walls. And there are three cell types that you should be able to identify. The most common cell type, the ones that are the simple squamous cells that make up the respiratory barrier, these are going to be simply that, the type 1 or the simple squamous um, alveolar cells. And so those are the flattened nuclei. And these are the cells that make up the, 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 ro the walls of the alveoli. This is where the gas exchange occurs. The other two cells are going to have more of a columnar or a more prominent nucleus. And so the second type are the alveolar macrophages. And these macrophages, these tend to be these bigger cells with a very nice prominent nucleus and nucleolus in the center. Although these will exist in the walls as well as in the airspace, they tend to be easier to identify and more importantly, not misidentify if they're in the airspace. And so here's one. This cell seems to be separate from the wall. Here's another one. Here's a third one over here. These cells that appear to be separate, not part of the wall, but are actually in, physically in the airspace, these are going to be the alveolar macrophages. And these are important defense cells that help clean up and remove dust particles. They're also referred to as dust cells. And the third one are the type 2 alveolar cells, or also known as the septal cells. And these are going to be these cuboidal cells that are part of the alveolar wall. So here would be a nice example of one. Um, let's see, maybe over here we can see a couple of them. So these have the more classic cuboidal shape with a nice spherical nucleus. These type 2 alveolar cells, these are the ones that produce the surfactant that helps uh, reduce the surface tension within the lungs. Here's a second view. Uh, we can see macrophages, these large cells that exist within the airspace. We can see a couple nice examples of the type 2, the cuboidal cells that exist within the alveolar wall. Again, these are the ones that produce the surfactant. And then we can see a lot of the type 1 or the simple squamous ones that make up the alveolar wall, specifically the respiratory barrier. And so those are the three cell types that you should be able to identify within the alveoli in addition to just identifying at a lower magnification the alveoli, the alveolar ducts, and then the bronchioles. And if you see a larger tube in this lung tissue that has some cartilage, some hyaline cartilage around it, then that's going to be a bronchus.